Okay, so just to uh, remind you of what we are doing here, we are looking at this marvelous sutta known as the Greater Sutta on the Elephant's Footprint. And this sutta is really just an extended contemplation of uh, the four elements. I said we're going to talk about the four elements in a great bit of detail, and this is really it. And it is a very large amount of detail, and it's also very profound. It shows you how you can take this idea of contemplation of the uh, four elements all the way to the conclusion of the path itself. So let's just look at the very end of this sutta, and then we move on to the next one afterwards. So, uh, we have here, uh, though the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind is intact internally. Uh, so long as the exterior, the corresponding exterior um, object of the senses, uh, yeah, the last one for the mind, it is the thoughts, uh, as long as they don't come into the range, uh, and there is no corresponding engagement. Uh, there is no manifestation of the corresponding type of consciousness. So the mind is intact internally, and exterior thoughts come into range. Uh, so long as there is no corresponding engagement, uh, there is no manifestation of the corresponding type of consciousness. Uh, but when the mind is intact internally, and exterior thoughts come into range, uh, and there is corresponding engagement, then there is the manifestation of the corresponding type of consciousness. So again, the idea here, as we were talking about yesterday, is the idea there's three things that are required for there to be any kind of experience. There has to be the sense space, yeah, either the eye, the ear, the tongue, going all the way to the mind, and then there has to be the object of that sense space. And then there has to be the engagement. And the engagement is really that you give attention to what is going on. Yeah, so in the case of the mind, you can, it's, it's a little bit strange that the thought is considered exterior, right? It's kind of weird because the thoughts is very much an inner kind of experience that we have. But I suppose it is exterior in the sense that it, it is not a necessary part of the mind. Yeah, when you are very peaceful and the, and the thought comes into your mind, when you are very peaceful, it is almost like a disturbance. It is like an external thing that you don't really want to engage with. And then you can choose whether you pay attention to the thought or not. And if you don't pay attention to the thought, it kind of disappears very quickly and there is no problem. Or you can really engage with that. Yeah, and then it keeps on going because you are engaging with it. Uh, so it is always the three things that have to come into together, and then there is the manifestation of that experience, uh, the experience of a thought, uh, the experience of any kind of mental phenomenon in this way. Uh. And then, uh, when the Par Venerable Sariputta carries on in the same way that we saw last time, uh, yeah, the form produced in this way is included in the grasping aggregate of form. Yeah, so whatever form is produced by that engagement when there is a, any kind of experience, and you may think that this is mental. So if it is mental, how can there be a form? Isn't form all about what we see? Isn't form about what we touch in the world? But the point is that a form can be produced mentally because a form is also uh, what the, when we see things with the mind, yeah? when we have a, mental experiences, uh, can also take the other five senses uh, as their objects. So the mind is like all inclusive. The mind includes the mental phenomena that are pure samadhi experiences, uh, and it also includes the other senses. It takes the other senses as its objects. Uh, and this is why when we talk about form, it actually carries on a long way into meditation practice. And then he says the feeling, perception, choices and consciousness produced in this way are each included in the grasping 
ag aggregate of, uh, of, of, of these things, yeah? So whenever there is an experience, uh, if, even if that experience basically is about form, all the other aggregates are also included within that uh, because the aggregates always come together. Uh, they are like a group of phenomena that arise together in the world. Uh, so you're always like, whenever there is an experience in the world, uh, the five aggregates are going to be there as part of that experience. Uh, and this is how, yeah, the point that the Vinabhasar Putta is making here is that this is how there always has to be all the five aggregates in the world. Uh, whenever there is a sense experience of any kind, uh, there will always be the five aggregates that come as part and parcel of the sense experience. Uh, and as long as there is the five aggregates, well, this is kind of, you know, what this is leaning towards, uh, what the Buddha says at the very beginning, the definition of the noble truth of suffering is that in brief, the five grasping aggregates are suffering. So if sense experience means that we must have the five aggregates, it means that we must have suffering. Suffering comes out of experience. Every moment of experience it really is, according to the Buddha, a kind of suffering. So this is the point that has really been made here. We are always producing this suffering because we cannot stop ourselves from attending to the sense spaces. If the sense spaces have arisen in the world and they arise with the idea of rebirth, yeah, once they arise in the world, suffering is a consequence of that. You cannot avoid suffering because that is the nature of sense experience. And this is really what this means. But um, this is getting very profound now. And uh, so it's kind of moving a little bit away from the basic idea of the uh, four elements. But uh, I, I, it's nice to go through it just to be able to see what is going on here. So they understand this is how there comes to be the inclusion, the gathering together, the joining together in these five aggregates. Uh, yeah, the idea that it arises with the sense experience itself. The Buddha has also said that one who sees dependent origination sees the teaching. One who sees the teaching sees dependent origination. Yeah, the idea here is that if you really understand the nature of reality, what you understand is the dependent arising of all of these things. And of course, one of the main aspects of dependent arising is that these five aggregates arise in the world depending on desire. This is the whole idea of, the per of rebirth, the whole idea of um, uh, things being created, coming from desire, coming from attach attachment and all of these kind of things. And that's why it says, and these five grasping aggregates are indeed dependently originated. They originate, they come into existence. The desire, adherence, attraction, and attachment for these five grasping aggregates uh, is the origin of suffering. Uh, it is the origin of suffering precisely because uh, uh, it origin uh, suffering is equivalent to the five aggregates. Uh, this is how it comes to happen. This is how it actually arises. Uh. So the Vendabha Sariputta is bringing things back here, starting with form, yeah, using, actually starting with the four elements, yeah, and then bringing it back, showing how the very existence of the four elements, uh, implying experience, uh, bringing it back, all the way back to the Four Noble Truths, uh, because this is what he started out with, uh, starting out with the Four Noble Truths, uh, analyzing it down to the four elements, uh, each element in turn, uh, and then bringing it back again to the Four Noble Truths. Uh. So it's a very kind of um, skillful way of teaching. It is almost like this teaching is almost like kind of, it, is, it's, it has this very complex form. Yeah? It is a very, that you can kind of zoom in more and more in these teachings uh, and zoom in on the particulars and then you can bring it back again and zoom out again. Uh, and the whole thing is uh, kind of contained within this. Uh. So giving up, and getting rid of desire uh, and greed for these five grasping aggregates uh, is the cessation of suffering. Yeah? So here we have the 
ending of, of suffering. Again, you either desire the aggregates or you don't. Uh, yeah, so again, the idea here is uh, simply bringing it back to the uh, basics. Uh, and in this way, you uh, can see the Four Noble Truths coming out of this. Uh, and then he says, at this point, uh, much has been done by that mendicant, by that monastic. Uh, and that, of course, is one of these great, beautiful understatements in the suttas. Uh, yeah? Both the Buddha and all the great Arahants, they're always very understated. Uh, but of course, at this point, you're already a stream enter to see all of these things, uh, to understand dependent origination, to understand how the five aggregates are perpetuated by desire, by ignorance in this way. Uh, this is basically one of the most profound insights you can have on the Buddhist path. Uh, so you're already a stream enter. So to say that much has been done is, again, it's a, 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 really a large understatement here. Uh. So what is the purpose of all of this? And the purpose of all of this, the reason I have been reading this out is just to give you an idea of how you can do the element contemplation. Keep it simple. Don't be too concerned about these more profound aspects of the sutta because it's very hard often to um, relate to directly. Do the things that you really can relate to. Do the things where you can actually understand what is going on. Yeah, and the very basic things that everyone can understand is how the body, how the four elements, the way we are built up is no different from the elements outside. It is all part and parcel of the same thing. And once you see that your body really is just part of nature, rising from nature, going back to nature, then the idea of clinging, of holding on, of grasping, of taking up, of attaching to this body, it doesn't really make any sense anymore. It belongs to nature. You have to let it go. It lives and it, and it uh, goes according to its own cause and conditions of the world. And there's nothing much there that you can control or you, can, you cannot have it the way you want it to be. And that is really uh, kind of the bottom line of these four elements. So this is the idea. So a lot of this, one of the things that you will realize when you kind of go, when we go through these suttas, uh, is how little distinction there is on the one hand between right view and on the other hand, be, uh, uh, developing the mind, understanding things, uh, yeah, and uh, doing these kind of meditation exercises. Uh, when you do this kind of meditation, when you contemplate the four elements, uh, you're actually giving rise to right view uh, because you are seeing the body more clearly. Uh, and when you see things more clearly, these kind of meditation exercises become more powerful. Uh, so you can see how this, these things are all kind of mixed together. There isn't any clear distinction between the developing the meditation, between thinking about the world in the right way and right view. They come together, they arise together, they're part and parcel of the same thing. So to give really rise to this right view, which aids the meditation practice, uh, you have to reflect on these things. Uh, you have to understand how these things actually you have to think, think about them to actually make sense of these four elements in this way. So a lot of the meditation that we do, a lot of the um, contemplations that we do are really reflections. They are about understanding the world, reflecting about the world in the right way. And when you do reflect on the world in the right way, that is where that right view arises. So uh, these things are all interlinked with each other. And this is really the main reasons why I wanted to talk about this, because this then later on becomes the foundation for the really deep meditation that we do when we watch the breath, that we do when we enter samadhi, that we do as we go towards the very end of the Buddhist path. So much has been done. That is what Venerable Sariputta said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what Venerable Sariputta had said. So there you are. That is the marvelous Maha Hatti Padopama Sutta, the greater sutta on the elephant's footprint. So I hope you too are satisfied and happy with what the Venerable Sariputta said. And if you are, then wonderful. And so again, have any questions about that, please? 
uh, ask those later on. Uh, so now let us move on to the next sutta. Which comes here. So um, this sutta is called uh, a monk, Bhikkhu Sutta. And uh, uh, the reason why I have included this sutta is because it shows uh, some of the foundations of, again, of meditation practice. Uh, and it makes it more clear, again, uh, what it is that we have to do uh, to have success in meditation. So uh, let's just start with it and see what happens. Uh, so, um, a monk. Yeah. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's monastery. Yeah. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, may the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. When I've heard it, I will live alone with a drawn, diligent, keen, and resolute. So here we have one of the standard ways that the suttas often are presented, how they start out. Of course, the Buddha staying at Savati again. Every sutta we have seen so far, the Buddha or Venerable Sariputta or whatever is staying at Savati. We can see how important this monastery was. And then you have a typical situation where a monastic will go up to the Buddha and they will ask for a teaching. And they will ask for a teaching because they are ready to practice seriously. They want to withdraw and kind of go into the forest or whatever. And, but they need something to reflect on. They need something to carry with them when they go into the forest, into seclusion. And uh, this shows you a little bit about how things were done at the time of the Buddha because they didn't have as many teachings as we have. Yeah, they may have heard a few teachings, uh, but they want to have a specific thing that they can contemplate uh, to support them when they are in seclusion. And of course, one of the things about the Buddha, yeah, the Buddha will look at you and he will kind of see through you, he will have that kind of powerful look where you feel like, oh, he's seeing everything within me, he sees every thought I have and these kind of things. Uh, and uh, of course, the Buddha has, will have that ability to understand different personalities, uh, the different inclination of beings. Uh, so he will give you a teaching that is very suited to you. Uh, and this is why people will come to the Buddha in this way. Uh. But at the time of ancient India, this was much more important because they didn't have the teachings in writing or whatever. So it was much more important to have a teaching that you can carry with you in this way. Uh. And so this is um, kind of interesting, right? It shows you how little uh, you actually need to remember, how little teaching you actually require uh, to be able to practice well. The Buddha gives you one teaching, you take that teaching with you, and that is all you have. Uh, we don't need to make it so complicated. Uh, yeah? We don't need to have the whole tipitika to understand what is going on. Uh, if you have one inspiring teaching that really fires you up, that really you feel, wow, this is so beautiful, the whole path being almost encapsulated in that short teaching, that is often enough for you to reflect on and then take you forward in your practice. It can be something very simple like the Ovada Patimokkha. You probably, many of you will know the Ovada Patimokkha, where the Buddha says that uh, uh, one should... Uh, avoid doing what is bad, one should practice what is good, one should purify the mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Yeah, and if you remember that much, actually you're going to go a very long way on the path as a consequence. So sometimes just remembering a little bit of the Dhamma, carrying these beautiful bits of the Dhamma with you throughout the day to remind you, to inspire you, to keep you on the right track during the day can be incredibly Beautiful and very powerful. Uh, just the memory that you should live with kindness, avoiding what is bad, doing what is good, and purifying you. If you remember that during the day, in every situation, when you are with people, when you are 
difficulties arise, it guides you in the right way. It shows you what you're supposed to be doing here. Yeah. So it can be very useful. Most of the time you just need mindfulness, but this can also be very useful. And this is how they often live at the time of the Buddha. And there are places in the suttas where the monastics ask the Buddha these kind of things. How much do you actually need to know? How much do you need to, how many suttas do you need to study? Yeah, and maybe we are studying too many suttas. Maybe <laughs> there's just too many suttas on these kind of retreats. I'm not sure. But the Buddha says, if you remember one verse, a single verse of four lines, and you understand that deeply, that can be sufficient to take you all the way to awakening, if you take it properly. For most people, it is not enough. Most people need more inspiration. I know I need more inspiration. I need to really read the suttas very broadly, maybe because I don't know, I don't have those very powerful spiritual faculties, perhaps. But uh, it shows you that uh, the significance is more important to go deeply into a single teaching than sometimes to read very broadly. Anyway, this is what he does. And then he wants to withdraw, yeah, alone, withdrawn, diligent, like heedful, keen, inspired, inspired by the teaching, resolute, having that energy in your practice. But then the Buddha replies. He says, this is exactly how some foolish people ask me for something. But when the teaching has been explained, they think only of following me around. Yes, yeah, so the Buddha is saying here that actually people get these teachings uh, and then they don't use them properly. Instead of using these teachings in the right way, they just hang around. Yeah, they want to hang around with the Buddha. And you know what it's like when you are with a great spiritual master. Some of these very powerful people in the world, uh, when you are with them, you kind of enjoy it, just being with them because you feel maybe the metta, you feel the kindness, uh, you feel the support that you get from these beings. Uh, and you just want to sit there. You don't want to kind of bathe in the aura. And <laughs> you don't really want to. That's good enough. Yeah. And you're happy with it. And I've seen that happen many times. Yeah. When I've been with some of these great Buddhist uh, masters around the world, this is often what happens. People just hang around <laughs> and they enjoy themselves. But that is not the point. Yeah. In the end, the purpose of the Dhamma is precisely to withdraw, even following the Buddha around. Don't, the Buddha is saying, don't. Follow me around, yeah, go off into the forest. If you follow me around, you're going to be hanging out with all the people. It's going to be very crowded because a lot of people want to see the Buddha. Go off on your own, yeah, go into the forest, go to a meditation retreat center, do these things where you can really practice in the right way. So he's giving this monk an encouragement, yeah, to live in the right way, to do the right thing, yeah. So you can see the, uh, the, sometimes the Buddha can be quite, uh, he can be a bit um, direct. Yeah? He gives you advice directly. He is probably friendly. He's coming from loving kindness, uh, but he's also saying things in quite a direct way so that you understand what you're supposed to do. And of course, then the monk becomes a little bit kind of, uh, um, he understands, yeah? And so then he begs the Buddha, sir, May the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. May the Holy One, the Holy One is the Sugato, again the Buddha, teach me the Dhamma in brief. Hopefully I can understand the meaning of what the Buddha says. Hopefully I can be the heir of the Buddha's teaching. Yeah. So the uh, idea here is that he understands, okay, yes, this imp is important. I will really listen to what you have, what you are saying, and then I will go off into the forest and do the right thing. Yeah. Please, please, Venerable Sir, give me a teaching for my benefit. Yeah. Then this is the teaching that the Buddha gives. Yeah, This is what he says. And he says, well then, mendicant, well then, monk, you should purify the starting point of skillful qualities. What is the starting point of skillful qualities? Well purified ethics and correct view. When your ethics are well purified and your view is correct, 
then you should develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three ways, depending on and grounded on ethics. Yeah, so uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, well, this is the four satipatthanas. This is the mindfulness of breathing. This is the foundation of meditation as we find it in the suttas. But to be able to do that, to be able to watch the breath, and a large, it's very common to find it difficult, for people to find it difficult to watch the breath. Yeah? And uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced that, maybe all of you have experienced that sometimes it's very hard. So the foundation here is really the significant thing. Yeah? And this is why the Buddha points out this foundation, the starting point, where we should start out. What are the foundational good qualities that we should build up in ourselves? This is so important. Without that, the meditation is not going to work. And what are these foundational skillful qualities? Well, they are purified ethics. Uh, so purified ethics is just kindness. Yeah? This is what I call kindness in the, when I teach. Because kindness is very broad and it brings in all the various aspects of ethics. On the one hand it is kindness and on the other hand it is correct view. And I, and I always found this very interesting, this particular uh, point that purified ethics and correct view are taught together in this way as the foundation not just the foundation of the entire spiritual path, not as the foundation of insight, but as the foundation of meditation practice. Yeah? Why is a correct view an important part to make meditation work? And the reason is because if you are going to be able to focus on the breath, you have to give priority to the breath. You have to make the breath important. The breath has to be more important than all the other things in the world. How are you going to make the breath more important than all the other things in the world? Well, the only way you're going to do that is because you know that the breath actually is what matters and all the other things are not as important. But usually it is the other way around. The vast majority of people, they think it is the things in the world that are important how we make progress in our careers, how we gain whatever there is to be had in the world. That is what we normally think of as the most important. And then we do practice maybe the Dhamma and the Buddhist teachings as a support for success in the world. But if we do it in that way, we're never going to have success in meditation. Because if we see the worldly things as the most important, then when you sit down and you try to be peaceful, as we're doing just now, the mind will very quickly go and think about the worldly things. Why? Because that is what is important in our life. That is what we consider the priority and the spiritual life is secondary, only to support what we are doing in the worldly life. So by correcting our view, by understanding what is really in our long term, um, for our long term benefit, uh, by seeing these things in the right way, uh, we actually enable meditation to happen. Uh, it is such an important thing to understand. Uh, and this is why I have been saying all along about the world is out of control. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the world. We don't know what's going to happen in our work, in our family life, in the world at large, outside, in terms of all of these things that can go wrong in the world. We have no idea. There is no refuge to be had in that world. That world is just too uncertain. And because of that uncertainty, because there's no refuge to be had there, we find the refuge in the only place where it can be found. And that is on the spiritual path within ourself, the home within where we can find that peace and security inside. And that is where we actually create the future. So that is the idea of right view. And I'm going to talk much more about this because I think this is such an important part of things. And as your mind then gradually shifts and you start to understand things in the right way, meditation becomes more powerful. You're less distracted by all the external thoughts and all of these things. And then things really start to come together in your practice. Okay, so the um, 
Buddha talks about the idea of correct view, yeah, and again, it's very interesting that it actually matters so enormously for meditation practice because it gives you the priorities. It shows you what we should prioritize, what really we should focus on in our life. But uh, the correct view really only works if you also purify your ethics, if you live with kindness. Yeah, Remember when I say kindness, I don't mean anything superficial. I mean something incredibly profound because kindness is very difficult. If you're going to take kindness to its uh, limit all the way, uh, it actually has to do with your entire life, all your conduct, the way you think, the way you perceive the world, uh, the way you act, the way you speak. It is a very, very broad thing, the idea of kindness. Uh, so when you understand ethics in the right way, it is this, it's basically about your entire life. Uh, that is what ethics really is about. Uh, so kindness. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, when you have the right view, yeah, then you understand, okay, let me let go a little bit of the world. The world is not so important. Uh, but then you need something else to support your meditation. But just, because just giving up the world uh, is not going to work. Uh, you need something to take its place. And what takes its place is the ethics. The kindness that you live in your daily life gives you an inner glow, an inner power, an inner peace, yeah, that enables you to meditate properly because you have that stability inside which comes from that kindness within. So kindness here gives you the support that makes meditation possible. You cannot just give up the world, you cannot just give up all of these things and have nothing in its place. It is only when you have the good, the good feeling within that uh, comes from kindness, that the giving up of the world becomes possible. So purified ethics always goes together with correct view. Uh, yeah, the correct view and the, uh, this, the, these two things coming together in this way is what allows meditation to happen because you have that solid foundation right there. Uh, so I hope you get the idea of what I am talking about. Uh, and. Um, and then comes the meditation, yeah? And this is why the Buddha says that when your ethics are well purified uh, and your view is correct, uh, the uh, Pali word here is ujjaka, and ujjaka means like your view is straight. And straight, of course, means straight. It aligns with the teachings of the Buddha. You have a view which aligns with how the Buddha sees the world. Uh, then, and only then can you develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three different ways, depending on and grounded on ethics. So what exactly does that mean, depending on and grounded on ethics? And of course, it means that the general idea of kindness is a very powerful support for meditation. But what it also means, it means the idea, when we often talk in Buddhism, we talk about sila nusati, which is the recollection of our sila. Yes, sila is what is ethics here. Sila is what I mean by kindness and all of these kind of things. Yeah? So we also recall these things. It's a sila nusati. It's a recollection of the way we live. And this becomes a very important grounding for the meditation practice. Because when you recall, when you know that you are living well, and sometimes you don't have to recall very much, it's almost like obvious, yeah? you just know that you are living well, so you feel good about yourself. When you recall that, you feel the gladness inside, you feel the joy inside, and of course that joy, that gladness is what brightens you up and what enables you to watch the breath. That is where the breath becomes very powerful. That is where the mindfulness meditation actually really works. Yeah, so the, when we talk about grounded on ethics, it actually also implies this whole idea of recalling your good conduct, recalling your generosity, the chaga nusati, and all of these things. Yeah? And before I was talking about the idea of the Kalyana Mitta during the meditation, and that is another recollection talked about in the suttas. 
whereby you re recall the fact that you are so fortunate uh, to have all of these wonderful Kalyanamitas. Uh, yeah? And that also kind of comes together with ethics in a sense, uh, because it means that you remember the ethics and the goodness in the community around you that also reflects on your own ethics uh, and kind of the whole thing comes together in this way. Uh, it becomes one of the most very, the most important support for meditation practice. And this is why I think Sila Nusanti is probably the best kind of contemplation to do to support your meditation, to remember that kindness that you are living with. So what are these four kinds of mindfulness meditation? And you know this already, I'm just going to go through it very quickly because these are the things that we look at we're going to be looking at in much more detail. These are the four Satipatthanas. So let me just uh, read through them just for the sake of uh, completeness in this particular sutta and maybe very briefly comment a little bit, but not very much. So these are, you meditate by observing you know, or contemplating an aspect of the body internally. You are keen, aware and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Yeah? Or you meditate observing an aspect of the body externally. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. You meditate observing an aspect of the body, both internally and externally. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. So this is the standard way that Satipatthana practice, the mindfulness meditation is explained in the suttas. And this is a very interesting little passage right there. All the little aspects here are very important, but I'm not going to tell you now. This is just a preview so that when we get to the Satipatthana sutta, yeah, later on we get to the actual sutta about this, then we can go through these things in the detail. So this is just to get you excited to make sure you come back on the next few days so you don't miss out on this explanation. So now I'm just going to say, yeah, this is, this is what it is about. This is the body contemplation, first of all, the kaya nupasana. Then you meditate observing an aspect of feelings, internally, externally, internally, and externally. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Yeah, so first of all, the body, then the feelings. Then you meditate observing an aspect of the mind, internally, externally, internally, and externally. Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Then you meditate observing an aspect of principles, or maybe phenomena, internally, externally, internally, and externally. Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. When you develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in these three ways, depending on and grounded on ethics, you can expect growth, not decline in wholesome qualities, whether by day or by night. So uh, this is the path, yeah? and this is how then uh, Meditation gradually, gradually increases your wholesome qualities. And uh, this is one of the, I think, uh, important guidelines in the suttas. You have this idea of always improving and growing in skillful qualities. And this is one of the things that I think you should always ask yourself. Yeah? You should ask yourself, uh, are you growing in, spiritual, in uh, good qualities? Can you see that there is an increase happening over time? Can you see that you are changing, that you're actually moving in the right direction? And if you're not increasing in good qualities and skillful qualities, then you should ask yourself why that actually is the case. Because that means that you're not actually gaining the benefit of this practice. There should always be that growth in skillful qualities there. This, is, in a way, is a very powerful way of reminding yourself uh, whether you're actually heading in the right direction or not. Uh, and uh, we need these kind of guidelines to ensure that we actually are going in the right direction. Otherwise, uh, you may stop up uh, and you may not go anywhere at all. Uh, and this, of course, is going to be very problematic. Yeah.
And then we just have the uh, end of the sutta uh, very quickly. Uh, and then that mendicant approved and agreed with what the Buddha said. Uh, he got up from his seat, bowed, uh, respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on his right. Uh, and then he left. Then that mendicant, he did what he said he was going to do. Yeah, He lived alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen, energetic, resolute. And then he soon realized the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. He lived having achieved with his own insight the goal for which gentlemen... Yeah, gentlemen, does that make sense? <laughs> The idea of gentlemen, right? So, or maybe gentle women. Maybe we should have gentle. Maybe gentle people is a better translation. But uh, it is fascinating. Why? Why is the word gentleman there? What does that got to do with it? Uh, isn't it just people? Why does it say gentlemen? Gentlemen rightly go forth from their lay life to homelessness. Uh, and the word behind gentleman here is kula putta. It means like a person who belongs to a clan, yeah, belongs to a, an extended family. And these were like the establishment of ancient India. So that the establishment, the people who belong to kind of the higher ranges of society, they would also go forth. Yeah? And this is how they found that supreme end of the spiritual life. Uh, the point here is just that anyone has the benefit of, you know, it's, it's beneficial for everyone to go forth in this way and actually become a monastic. Yeah? That's really the point. That's why you have the word gentleman there, because it may sound a bit strange. It may sound as if this is some kind of practice done by a proper British, uh, you know, person of a certain class who practices in the right way. And uh, it is a little bit like that. Yeah, it's a little bit like that because it doesn't matter. That's the point. Uh, what your position in life is. Yeah, it doesn't really matter because uh, uh, regardless of what it is, this is, a, this is what we should all be doing because life just isn't that satisfactory wherever you are in the, whatever your station in life is. And then it says he understood. Rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. And that mendicant became one of the perfected ones. In other words, he became an arahant, yeah, as a consequence. And uh, that is then what uh, happened to this monk. He followed the instructions of the Buddha in a very good way. And uh, as a result, he uh, then went all the way to the end of the path. And this is what we can expect too, if you do these things fully and you practice these things all the way. Uh, that is the outcome of this. So it's a pretty good outcome. And all we really have to do is then to have the ethics, to have the right view at the beginning, practice the meditation, and bang, you become an arahant as a consequence. It's a very good deal. So I, I recommend you to engage in this deal yeah, and to actually take it up. All right. So... Let us move on to the next sutta. All right. So, uh, Here we are. So this is the uh, uh, another beautiful little sutta, and it's more on the theme of right view, because I've just shown how right view is the foundation for the entire meditation practice. And because I've shown that, I want to now elaborate even more on the idea of right view. Yeah. So how can we establish this right view? I think it is generally in Buddhism, we, it is underappreciated how important right view is, how important it is to think about the world in the right way. And the more we do this, the more we, again, align our view of the world with the way the Buddha talked about the world, the more we do that, the easier meditation becomes. This is very, I think, underappreciated. 
And unless we take this seriously, actually, we're not really going to make that much progress in our meditation practice. So this particular sutta is from the Sutta Nipata, SNP is Sutta Nipata. It is, as you see there, it is 4.15, and 4.15, 4 is the fourth chapter of the Sutta Nipata. The fourth chapter is known as the Ataka Vaga. Ataka Vaga means the chapter of eights, yeah? And this chapter is a very interesting chapter in the Sutta Nipata, because this uh, has some of the most ancient poems, uh, some of the most ancient verses that are probably found in the Pali Canon. Uh, these verses exist also in Chinese translation. They are talked about in other places of the Canon. The Canon refers back to these verses. Uh, so we know that they were a core aspect of the early suttas as they were taught by the Buddha. So the, for that reason, they are very interesting here. Uh, and uh, this particular sutta is uh, another case of the Buddha um, talking about his life before he became the Buddha, when he was the Buddha to be. Yeah, he was already kind of inclining towards a kind of renunciation and these kind of things. So this is how the Buddha was thinking before he became a monk. Yeah, yeah this is very interesting because if you can understand how the Buddha was thinking before he became, becomes a monk, you can have some idea of what drives the whole path of Buddhism, what drives the idea of monasticism, what drives the ability to meditate and all of these kind of things. Yeah, this is what this really is about. So if you understand how the Buddha was thinking before he became a monk, what made the Buddha become a monk, yeah? It means that you too will understand how you should direct your mind to enable these things to happen, the meditation, the path of practice, and all of these kind of things. So personally, I find these things very interesting yeah, and very powerful. Yeah. And uh, because of that, I, uh, I, I really enjoy these kind of suttas uh, because they go to the very core of what it means to practice Buddhism in the right way, to think about the world in the right way, to give rise to that kind of right view. Uh, so this sutta is called Taking Up Arms. It is the 15th sutta of this particular chapter, the Atakavaga of the Sutta Nipata. And uh, I will read through it and then I will come back and I will comment on these verses afterwards. So, so this is what the uh, Buddha to be, how he was thinking before he became the, the Buddha. So, um, here we go. Uh, Peril stems from those who take up violence. Just look at people in conflict. I shall extol how I came to be stirred with a sense of urgency. I saw this population flounder like a fish in a little puddle. Seeing them fight each other, fear came upon me. The world around was hollow. All directions were in turmoil. Wanting a home for myself, I saw nowhere unsettled. But even in the settlement they fight. Seeing this, I grew uneasy, or I grew, and I, I gave up desire. Then I saw a dart there, so hard to see, stuck in the heart. When stuck by that dart, you run, run about in all directions. But when that same dart has been plucked out, you neither run about nor sink down. Whatever attachments there are in the world, don't pursue them. Having pierced through sensual pleasure in every way, train yourself for Nibbana. So that is the beginning of a very long poem. And uh, the remainder of the poem is all about the path of practice. Uh, yeah, how we should practice to kind of uh, um, take it all the way to awakening. And then the very last part of the path is actually about awakening itself. Uh, 
the state, the result of all of this kind of practice. So the very beginning here, what I have been reading out now is really the right view. Yeah, it is the foundation of the practice. You can see here how the Noble Eightfold Path is reflected in this, starting off by right view, understanding the world in the right way. As a consequence of understanding the world in the right way, then the Buddha becomes a monk and he practices. Yes, yeah? so the practice, the Noble Eightfold Path comes out of that right view. And at the very end, we then see the result of the practice. And the result of the practice is really just arahantship, yeah, it's all the way at the very end of the path. So you can see the whole path here laid out in a sense, yeah, right view, practice, and then ending up with the highest realization of that path as a consequence. So right view here again is the foundation. This is what we really need to understand. And if you understand right view in a powerful way here, it is as if the whole path unfolds almost by itself. There's nothing you have to do. The path just happens. Yeah? And this is kind of the uh, beautiful way about, of this, the beautiful way of the idea of right view. So let's have a look here in a bit more detail about what is going on. There. The Buddha says, peril stems from those who take up violence. Just look at people in conflict. I shall extol how I came to be stirred with a sense of urgency. Yeah. Peril stems from those who take up, con take up violence. Yeah. Violence here is this idea. It's not just the idea of fighting or wars or being directly violent. Uh, violence here includes the violence that we do in speech sometimes. Uh, the way we treat each other in a bad way uh, is the whole thing that arises from anger, that arises from these negative feelings that we have inside of us. Yeah? And once we have these negative feelings, uh, then the world is in conflict. The world is, has a problem. Yeah? There is violence. This is in integral to the whole way the world actually is. There is always conflict in this human realm. And the Buddha says, when I saw this, uh, I got a sense of urgency here. I got concerned about this. Yeah? The Buddha carries on. He says, I saw this population flounder here, like a fish in a little puddle. Seeing them fight each other, fear came upon me. Here. And this is kind of, I, I don't know about you, but to me this is very, very powerful ideas. Here. Because remember, the person that we are dealing with here, the person who is saying these things, here, it's not just an ordinary person. The person who says there is the greatest spiritual master, the greatest spiritual genius in human history. This person, this Buddha, became fearful. Yeah, the word behind fear is bhaya in Pali, and bhaya means fear or seeing danger or whatever. Yeah? So the Buddha became fearful. So why does the Buddha become fearful? What is going on here? And it's this idea of like a fish in a little puddle. You know, when you have a fish in a little puddle, the fish is floundering. It is kind of, uh, you know, trying to kind of get out of the puddle. It's thrashing around, trying to get out of this. But there is no way for the fish to go. The fish is like doomed in a little puddle. In the same way, we are all part of this world together. And the world is a fairly small place. Yeah, there's nowhere to really go outside of this world. We're all trapped on this planet together. And when you look at the population around you, it is floundering in this way. We're always taking up violence with each other. We're always arguing in one way or another. We're arguing perhaps within the family, or we are arguing but maybe within the company with each other, or we are arguing in the local community or within the nation or between the nation. There's always arguments going on. There's no escape from these things. There's always violence just behind the scenes waiting to come out because it is so deeply rooted in our hearts. There is no way to get away from this. If you are part of this world, if you're part of this population, you will flounder like everyone else. There is no other way out of this. And this is so interesting. It is such a powerful insight into the nature of our world. 
It is the understanding that when you are part of the realm of the five senses, whether that's in your mind when you think about it, or it is a direct experience of that realm of the five senses, whatever it is, that realm is such that there will always be competition in that realm. There will always be antagonism. There will ultimately always be a degree of violence and a degree of trouble in that world. It is the nature of the world that we live in that will, there will be problems, there will be violence, there will be competition, there will be arguments, there will be all of these kind of things. It is the nature of that world. And this is what we need to understand. And when you understand that the nature of the world is this, then of course you start to be less interested in that world. Because you know that there is no solution. There is no political system that you can create whereby the world is going to be living in peace. The problems are always going to come back in one way or another. That is the nature of this existence. And the reason for that is simply because when we live in the world of the five senses, when we are supported by and we find happiness in the world of the five senses, because that world is outside of us and because we're always competing for that world, trying to achieve things that are in conflict with other people, conflict must arise because we want the same thing in that external world.